So maybe a first question would be, give us a state of just your tribe. Madison has just been designated in December, Truax Field, as the home of F-35A. Doctor, can you start? Give us an overview. Preston Cole had an important job for the city of Milwaukee when Governor Evers called him and said, would you be the secretary of the State Department of Natural Resources? So you've, been a, you've had a busy six months, but I'm so glad you finally get a chance to sit down with uh, Wisconsin Eye. Secretary Cole, thank you very much. Thank you. And if you're a fan of open government, you're a fan of Wisconsin Eye, and so I'm actually honored to be here. Thank well, you. Thank you, sir, for your compliment. I really appreciate it. It's the year of clean drinking water, um, yet contamination Southwest Wisconsin, Kewanee County. You've been on the job six months, so I gave you six months to study the issue. How big a threat is it to our uh, environment, sir? It's our number one issue. Number uh, one issue. In the state of Wisconsin as it relates to public health and also the environment. And the governor got it right as he um, championed the year of clean drinking water. Having heard from Wisconsinites around the state of Wisconsin, whether you live in the southwest part of the state or in cities around the state of Wisconsin, we know that uh, drinking water is at issue in many communities. And I often ask people who um, are on bottled water, those individuals in you know, Marinette and, and Peshtigo and those areas, how do you live with drinking water? Just the encumbrance of protecting your own health, that you have to go to the store once a week or somebody's bringing you drinking water in plastic bottles. And so, quite frankly, people are worried. My responsibility and is to ensure, along with health services and the governor, the legislature, that this is going to be a big lift for us. And so, but we're excited to be here and we're excited to work on this particular issue, but there's a lot at stake with regard to public health. Do People relying on private wells, do they need to be ready for it to get worse before it gets better? And the, re the, the context of that, sir, is the governor's veto message said the legislature put up $32 million, but we had hoped that they'd devote so much more resources. Is it going to get worse before it gets better, Mr. Secretary? Well, here's the, here's the landscape. There's 1.7 million people that get their water from about 800,000 private wells. And so when you're in cities, towns, and villages hooked up to municipal systems, there's anywhere from 50 to 1,000 tests that go on on these public drinking water systems. Private drinking waters are a different story. Those, te th those tests can, you know, go in uh, tens of hundreds of dollars. Mm -hmm. And if you're on a fixed income, we know that uh, individuals on private wells aren't testing their wells. About 10% of those individuals are testing their wells. 10%. 10%. And that's worrisome for us because of the public health implication. Many of those wells fail in a number of areas for arsenic, uh, fail in a number of areas around nitrates. nitrates. And so we're worried about that, but we're worried from the standpoint, it's one's ability to pay for those. We believe that we should begin the discussion to allow for Department of Health Services, and the DNR to work more collaboratively with private well owners to ensure some periodic uh, testing of their drinking water. How often, you alluded to I think 1.7 million that rely on private wells, mm -hmm. how often should they be testing their private wells, sir? Private well owners should be testing their wells annually. Instead of the 10 percent rate right now? Well, the 10 percent of the, um, you know, 800,000 wells are being tested. Thank you. And the notion is, is that you want to know what's in your water. You have to know what's in your water. It's groundwater. And given the fact that groundwater in many areas of the state of Wisconsin are being challenged by uh, contaminants and, uh, you know, contaminants that we know, didn't know that were on the landscape, we have to lean towards public health. And so, you know, I implore uh, private well owners to do whatever they have to do to test their well water on an annual basis. And some of those private well owners can turn to the local governments and get it tested for free, but others, there's a cost. Is there a, is there a universal standard in terms of who pays for that, sir? There isn't a universal standard. Should Most there often, be? <laughs> well, I, I tend to think that we should establish, uh, and it's been established, just this notion of testing it on an annual basis. That's the goal. But we know people can't pay for it. So what's the role of government around the state of Wisconsin when there is an epidemic relative to clean drinking water and private wells? 
we should come to the fore. We should double down on in, in assistance programs to assist those individuals uh, with well testing. And how that will happen has yet to be designed, but we're ready to sit down with the legislature. We're ready to sit down with local officials to figure out what that plan of action is because there's way too much at stake. The contamination has spread. Uh, is it going to get worse before it gets better? Well, here's what I will say. Depending on where you are in the state, yes, sir. it's a myriad of contaminants. If you live in the northwest part of the state, in that Green Bay area, in Marinette, uh, PFAS are now in your groundwater. That is a term that we, we d we've heard only recently, mm -hmm. the PFAS. Now, that's, a, and that's something that comes, a, that's a chemical from an industrial process, sir? It is. Per fluoral alkyl, uh, chemical compound. How and insidious is it? These are legacy contaminants. They, are, they, they accumulate in our systems over time. And I, too, use Scotchgard and Scotchgard on your outdoor fabric. And these are chemicals that make things slippery and water repellent. You know, your coats that are water repellent, your Teflon pans, these are all PFAS and PFOA related chemicals. They bioaccumulate. That's the worrisome part. We know that it's in groundwater in certain parts of the state of Wisconsin and in Southwest. If you're there in that karst topography, that horseshoe we call, yeah. that slurry and dolomite, underneath your, uh, under, underneath your home is a slurry and dolomite is like Swiss cheese. And so depending on what people put on the land, whether it's nitrogen, agricultural products, runoff from other places, will wind up in your groundwater. And of course, lastly, the most important issue is lead in drinking water because of its insidiousness in children and pregnant women. That gets us to the debate. The $40 million that the governor recommended to help rebuild the laterals from the mu municipal lines into homes. The Republicans said no. Uh, one Green Bay Republican stood up on the floor of the assembly and said, we paid for this without government help. Maybe Milwaukee should do the same. Any thoughts on that as a former Milwaukee official? Well, there are 130 city towns and villages spread across the state that have lead laterals. This is not a Milwaukee issue. This is a statewide issue. This is a this is an implication where the state government has to step in. If not, where do people get the relief? Capital budgets on cities are strained as they are. But this governor led with our lead uh, ombudsman and to work on our to work with us and DHS on clean drinking water programs that may offer some relief to city towns and villages. We have towns and villages that may have one lead lateral. Up to 77,000 of those that are in uh, Milwaukee. We think that the human health implications as I've mentioned before for children under the age of 6 and for pregnant females this is a crisis. Well, so let's say I rely on a private well for my family's water. And I listen to this show, and I get it tested, and I don't like the results. What should I do next, sir? Your next stop is to your public health official, whoever, that, whether that's in the county or your local jurisdiction. That begins the process to design a path forward, which is either redrilling or getting off of that system and maybe hooking up to uh, municipal systems. Those are all costly. Or you go back to drinking water from bottles and, and, and uh, you know, containers that are delivered to you. And so none of, it is, none of this is on its face easy to deal with, whether it's cost or whether it's how our lives have to change to accommodate bad water. It is always an issue of public health. And so we've got to lean on our public health officials to assist in this process, and they will step to the fore. The, uh, the DNR that, that you run is developing, or has it already submitted, new standards for groundwater contamination and nitrates and other chemicals, hasn't it? What, what, what's, what's the status of this? Well, certainly as of late, the Department of Health Services has issued for PFAS-related chemicals a 20 parts per trillion which is four drops in an Olympic-sized pool. But that four drops will do harm to anybody. And so those notions, that, that 20 parts per trillion is um, what I would call far lower than the EPA standard of 70 parts per trillion. And these are um, health standards uh, for groundwater. Mm -hmm. But of course, many of these private drinking wells that we've been talking about far exceed nitrate contamination, um, and other types of substances from whether it's uh, humix, uh, human septic systems that are in close proximity, uh, you would tend to think that uh, 
whether you live in a city or whether you live in rural, that someone should be paying attention. This governor's paying attention, I'm paying attention, and that's what the research and the science is. Science is merely an investigation. We've begun that investigation. We just don't like what we're finding. Part of this debate involved CAFOs, concentrated animal feeding operations. There was debate in the last budget whether your agency or DATCAP should be the one to monitor CAFOs. Um, your position on that, sir? Well, the United States Environmental Protection Agency sees us as the regulated authority. If you really want to confuse the public, you change. If you really want to add to the bureaucracy, you change. We stand ready to work with uh, the EPA as the delegated authority for environmental protection, and that's the way it should be. It's the way it's always been. Should there be a moratorium on CAFOs while we sort out how, um, how they may be damaging, conditional term there, may be damaging our groundwater, sir? Yeah, here's what I will tell you. In the last eight years, we've added 110 uh, CAFOs, combined animal feeding operations. Most of those, 60 or 70 percent of those, went into a two or three county area. If we had the opportunity, would we still do that? And would we put that on a substrate that leaks like a sieve, that is Swiss cheese, that's slurian dolomite, that will allow anything that runs off into the groundwater systems? Now, I'm not arguing for a moratorium. I'm arguing for common sense. The governor began his career as a science teacher. He says science is back as the DNR. Give us some specific examples of science being back at your agency, sir? Hallelujah. <laughs> and so adding uh, two scientists uh, to our PFAS um, investigative team, those scientists will be working on groundwater related PFAS now that we know that the test has been uh, promulgated as to how we go about finding. We're excited about that. We're excited about the four uh, FTEs that we're going to be putting on CAFOs and permitting. While we didn't increase the cost of those permits, mm -hmm. we're going to have more eyes and ears on CAFOs. And quite frankly, we'll be standing up new pages around climate change and around science as it relates to the Department of Natural Resources. The other implication, we're going to committees. If we have an issue that, that, that impacts the Department of Natural Resources, we will have scientists and those who know about that subject matter to appear. We will not take a stance, but we will give the legislature the science behind whatever they're debating. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but are you afraid at the level of groundwater contamination that we're now finding in Wisconsin? We're concerned. There is no question there is a huge amount of concerns. And, you know, I lay awake thinking about young women and children uh, that count on drinking water for their, for their growth and development, pregnant women in our cities, towns, and villages. This is a statewide crisis. This is not a Milwaukee issue. This is not a Madison issue. This is a state of Wisconsin issue. My hope is, is that the legislature follows the lead of this governor and continues to make investments in our public drinking water and private drinking water uh, services and systems. And I think it's happening. You can see where the legislature, through um, Speaker Voss, has started their own conversation task with force. the public yes, and their sir. task force on water quality. That, those are exciting developments that, you know, on the heels of the governor announcing the year of clean drinking water, that are those others in elected positions that also are coming to the fore. The national, no, let me correct myself, the international debate over climate change. Where do you start from, in the, you personally, in, in the debate over climate change, Mr. Secretary? First of all, it's real. You know, and as a natural resource manager myself, we invest in science. We are trained scientists, whether it's in soils or forests or water systems, fisheries and wildlife. And the application of science, again, is an investigation. And I think that the worldwide debate, countries, uh, cities across America are being, uh, are adapting themselves and mitigating these issues of climate change. Earlier this morning, you heard a Farmers Union and other concerned science talk about the number of days traditionally that we have in Wisconsin, which is about nine. By 2050, they predict there'll be more than 38 of those days, and certainly by the end of the millennia, it'll be well over 100 days over 90 degrees. 
that just doesn't happen in the upper Midwest. That's going to put our ecosystem, that's going to put our agriculture, and that's going to put our cities, towns, and villages. But more often, it's going to put our economy upside down. The 2011 study done by your agency in the UW doc, uh, talked about just that, how it threatens our fisheries, how it threatens our crop growing seasons. Now, that 2011 report didn't get a lot of traction over the last eight years. So do we need more research or do we need, need more action in terms of one state's fight against climate change? Well, here's what I will say. Action, action and action. We have to begin to mitigate and adapt our systems and our communities to be uh, resilient from these types of things. But it begins with an open, honest um, ideology about these circumstances that we find in our environment are real and we should adapt. With these extreme weather systems and floodwaters, we've got to pay attention to the chemicals and that are in that water. We have to pay attention to our infrastructure that we're putting in and make sure they're designed correctly to handle these floods. And as you see all over the world, from Africa to New York to Wisconsin to California, we are seeing scientists are seeing extremes that we haven't seen before as it relates to our environment. And it's all man-made. And if we can begin to coalesce around the idea that it is real, we can then begin to move faster towards mitigation and adaptation. What can one state do when the position of the federal government, the EPA, is, um, well, to quote the president, um, uh, climate change is a hoax, and the e EPA on greenhouse gases is dialing back some of the Obama administration rules and regulations. What can one state, Wisconsin, do on climate change, sir? Lead. Lead? Be the example for other states around designing and adaption to climate change. We have a wonderful organization, the Wisconsin um, group of individuals, the uh, Initiative for Climate Change Impacts. Yes. These are research scientists at the university. Now, the De Department of Natural Resources doesn't have climate re uh, change researchers, but what we do have are researchers on forestry, fisheries, water, wildlife, and those types of things. And we hear from the universities as to what they're seeing and what they're seeing in the long haul. We then are able to have a discussion on what those impacts are going to be on the wildlife and our fisheries. I mean, these Great Lakes, people make their way to these Great Lakes every year. Our economy is tied to outdoor recreation. That's a $20 billion investment that we're making that other people are paying that $20 billion. We cannot put that economy at stake. We have, you know, concessionaires that we count on in our state parks. There are homeowners who are also providing services for those who visit. You fill up at the gas station, you buy your, your fishing rods, you get your supplies. This economy is too important not to pay attention. So what do we do? We lead. Is the EPA not a partner? Uh, as, as you lead one state's effort to fight climate change, do you consider the EPA the enemy on this issue? No, they're not the enemy. They're certainly the regulator for states. And given the fact that the EPA is the regulator, other state agencies are making their way to talk to each other about climate change. The state of Michigan and Minnesota, we all have this conversation, whether it's water or whether it's climate change, and what are other states doing? And so we begin to coalesce around, again, this idea around the Great Lakes region and the investment that we have and what's at stake around climate change. EPA aside, I'm really counting on other state agencies to lead with Wisconsin to help us mitigate and adapt to climate change. Last question on climate change. As you go around the state talking to Wisconsin residents, is there a growing acceptance of the concept of climate change as a threat to our environment, sir? Without a doubt. Without a doubt. Okay. Um, let's talk about CWD. Very intriguing issue. It's another regional issue. Mm -hmm. Now, there's how much money in the current budget that was just signed, and it's going to do what? So, in other words, how is the agency going to go forward on the issue of cr chronic wasting disease? As I marched around during my confirmation hearings with senators and legislators um, around this issue of CWD, it was the number two item after drinking water. And there were many... Um, you know, expansive conversations around, and they were all different, you know, from uh, senators who said, let's not spend another dime on CWD until we know where we're going, mm -hmm. to those that says that we should spend millions, but on what? And so my responsibility, and I've been asked to do a uh, background on what have we accomplished since 2002 uh, when CWD first landed in that first year. 
-hmm. Well, the notion is is that it's we, we had a lot of operational types of uh, earn a buck, uh, hunting season changes. Both of those were met with angst from the hunting community. And now we are adding dumpsters, we're adding kiosks where people can, uh, hunters can drop off their skulls and spinal columns from deboned deers and we will test those deers for CWD. We know that the south, southern part of the state is endemic to CWD and we know that hunters are worried about where we're going with this. We have 5.2 million dollar over the next biennium. We got 101.1 million in hand that we're going to be, uh, you know, using to make sure that the hunting public has confidence in our surveillance, which is our sampling methodology, mm -hmm. finding out where it is and where it's not. And again, providing them the options of getting rid of deer. Now, if I could put a genie back in a bottle, electronic uh, registration of deer went away. I mean, is now the, the issue of the day, whereas bringing it to us to a uh, deer check station. Yeah. We had 400,000 individuals coming to us every year bringing their deer to get tagged and moved on. Well, since electronic registration, that is no longer the case. And so we are, at this point, reaching back out to those Tavern League owners above Highway 29 mm -hmm. to see if we can continue to partner with them because they were the largest voice, quite frankly, as to when those deer check stations went away. Because there's an economy around hunters coming to your gas station or your taxidermy shop. And, but it would for, what it would have would meant for us is that we would have got a chance to test deer coming to us at larger numbers. So 17,000, we hope to grow that to 25,000 over time. But here's what I believe is important. It's the research. Wisconsin has done something unusual. The Department of Natural Resources has asked researchers from the Great Lakes region to be here in Milwaukee later this month to begin the conversation of what research they're doing in their own state universities and Department of Resources around the Great Lakes region. We know we have 18 pages right now of research that's ongoing for CWD. The state of Michigan sent $5.2 million to Michigan State University in collaboration with Minnesota to find a quick test for deer. Deer test now for CWD takes about 12 to 15 days. That's what's running people out of uh, the opportunity to hunt is just waiting that long. They have to freeze that deer. It's cumbersome. Well, here's what we get when they find a quick test. One, the state of Wisconsin and its hunters will be using that quick test. And what don't we have to do? to leverage other monies from other states. We don't have to spend a $5 million that the state of Michigan. And so we're trying to bring those researchers who are working on a, a variety of CWD related issues, soil, prions, adaptability, recreating prions in the laboratory and throwing everything but the kitchen sink at it and see what works. So we have those researchers, those scientists are making their way here. Uh, Governor Evers will be taping a welcome for them because, as you know, he is a scientist himself. He wants us to lean in heavily on CWD with related to science. And so we're on it as it relates to science and CWD. The backdrop here, though, is CWD is a growing problem in Wisconsin, isn't it? Uh, CWD um, certainly is on the landscape and it's certainly been a growing problem since 2002. The debate over Asian carp that threatens Lake Michigan and there have been some tests showing evidence maybe that they're already there. How big an issue is that for um, the uh, DNR, our, our fishery, our commercial fishing? Uh, is that a large concern of yours, sir? Asian aquatic, um, not Asian, but... Asian carp? Asian carp, along with, you know, it's, a, it's, an, a, it's an invasive species. If that gets into the Great Lakes, it's going to put our whole ecosystem around the Great Lakes, you know, uh, upside down. It would be a deleterious effect on uh, our fishing population from trout to salmon and the like because these fish will gobble up the bait fish. How many years do we have to fight that, sir? Well, here's the thing. What? Just as it's timely, just yesterday, the governors and the two premiers voted along with uh, the, uh, on the Brandon Road Dam, along with, of course, the um, the engineers who designed these systems mm -hmm. to agree that we need to invest millions of dollars of infrastructure money to stop the Asian carp. Coming because up from Illinois? Coming up from Illinois. So the U.S. Corps of Engineers is leading that 
um, opportunity for us. But in unison, the Great Lakes governors and the two, and the two Canadian premiers unanimously voted to support that infrastructure improvement because way too much is at stake. Our economy around fishing, our economy around the five Great Lakes, that's 20 uh, percent of the world's freshwater resources. We can't take a chance. We only have a few years to get that right, don't we? We just, Well, I would say this. Part of getting it right is making sure the infrastructure improvements are in place to mitigate these types of things. So I would say the time of getting it right is now. Um, I was intrigued in the last budget the, uh, the decision of Governor Walker and lawmakers was uh, to make our park system operate based on the fees and no GPR subsidy. Have our parks suffered under that system, sir, of financing? I'd say there's challenges and opportunities. Of course, you know, the park systems are uh, our, our, our golden child. This is where people from around the Midwest, from around the world, from around certainly this country, make their way here for those family types of outdoor activities. Families have been coming to Peninsula State Park or Devil State Park and for years, for generations, we know that there's something at stake. We know that they have skin in the game. We know that we have skin in the game to provide that outdoor experience. And what that opportunity means is that we want to make sure that we lean in very heavily on park improvements, grow the business where people find their way here to some of our most popular uh, parks. But we also want to offer lower costs for parks that aren't visited as often mm -hmm. for another opportunity. So it's rethinking, not putting all our eggs in one basket, but let's shift the dynamic to go to some other smaller parks that don't see a lot of uh, pedestrian traffic and vehicular traffic, and they're going to have an equally wonderful experience for lower money. So do you like peak charging for Peninsula and Devil's Lake, two of our most popular parks? Well, put it this way, peak charging is everything we do. It's from, <laughs> from the true. parking tickets, you know, and peak demand. Uber. Uber, <laughs> yes. you know. So we, we know that those models that are out there, we want to use modern day technology. Our staff are uniquely adapting to park systems and the new uh, systems that are on the landscape to help us better manage a resource that provides these wonderful opportunities and revenues to the state of Wisconsin. Okay, time is slipping away. Just a couple more questions. We're now 30 or 40 years into the recycling debate. Some markets for recycled goods in China have collapsed. Do we need, does this nation need to rethink the whole recycling debate or is there still tangible good by you and I separating our plastics and glass? There is tangible good from separating our paper and glass. And as you know, my history is robust with recycling and having worked for the city of Milwaukee Department of Public Works, the largest public works organization in the state, where we joined efforts with Waukesha County on a new um, uh, dual stream um, recycling facility. If we went alone, the city of Milwaukee would have paid $15 million. If we, if well, Waukesha County went on their own, they would have paid $15 million. Together, we paid $15 million and split the cost. That makes us a bit more resilient. And that resiliency is important during down times when it comes to the pricing of paper, uh, new, of course, the new paper, corrugated um, paper, glass, and aluminum. Um, Counties like Brown County and uh, Oneida and those counties are beginning to and have what I would call the first model of these regional opportunities. Yes. And what those regional opportunities uh, is, ma again, make cities more resilient in terms of these downturns, but also prepare themselves for the upturns in the economy. It'll come back, but look at it this way. The importance of extending the life of our um, landfills is far too important. And the way to do that in your own home is parse out the paper, the aluminum, the glass, and put it on that recycling side and know that you're doing what's best for the economy, but also what's best for the environment. And of course, you know, uh, these downturns, hopefully it's a short blip. Mm -hmm. People are worried about it, but stay vigilant on recycling. It's way too important. Now, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask someone trained as a forester. How healthy is our forest and logging industry in Wisconsin? We only have a couple minutes left. Could always be better, but the Good Neighbor Authority allows us to work with the U.S. Forest Service and remove hardwoods and um, supplies off of their lands. We do those timber sales. Mills are humming in the north. 
Um, it was uh, the, the state of Wisconsin that is leading with that good neighbor authority. The undersecretary of the U.S. Forest Service hopefully will be here yet this year to, you know, christen this as something that can be done on other national forests around the country. We think that it's a unique partnership. Can it always be better? You bet. But our county forest systems, the U.S. Forest Service, and our uh, logging industry, we're all in unison to continue to grow that business in the state of Wisconsin because it's too important to our economy. Two quick final questions. Governor Walker put you on the DNR board in 2007. Mm -hmm. um, you have not yet been confirmed. But is there any doubt in your mind that you will eventually be confirmed by the state Senate? Well, I will leave it up to others to determine <laughs> that. I, I stand ready. You know, I've gone through my confirmation hearing. I've talked to everybody who will listen. And I think my performance and having served on 12 years of the, on the DNR board is a unique resume to be the secretary for the Department of Natural Resources. My hope is that we can move on. My last question. This budget provided, in some ways, more funding, more scientists. I want, I want you to look out beyond this budget mm -hmm. into the 2021-2023 budget. Goals for four years from now, sir. Well, this budget is a down payment, certainly on water. Mm -hmm. We're leading again, and asking, this governor has asked us to, uh, and he has reauthorized the stewardship fund. We will be uh, advising him on putting that blue ribbon commission together. So stewardship and what its long-term implications are going to be is going to be a future conversation. And of course, water. Yes. We will be leaning very heavily on water to fill the gaps that we know that need to be filled that this budget didn't address. So clean water is that number one issue. Certainly stewardship is in play. And certainly, you know, wildlife, fisheries, and things associated with outdoor recreation and our economy are going to, we're going to be paying very close attention to. It's only a down payment, and I'm excited about what the future holds for us with the next budget. Your excitement is obvious. Preston Cole, Secretary of the Department of Natural Resources, thank you so much for talking to Wisconsin Eye. Thank you for having Appreciated me. Appreciated the update. Thank you. Thank you. You're thank you. This program is a production of Wisconsin Eye, an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit media network with a mission to inform, educate, and engage the citizens of Wisconsin. Wisconsin Eye is the nation's first and only independently funded state civic broadcast network, providing gavel to gavel access to government proceedings and events at the state capitol. Wisconsin Eye would not exist without generous donors like you. Please visit wisai.org to make a donation today.